So I'm not going to describe very many new things here in this talk. I'm uh, just going to summarize what we've done in the last two years and uh, I try to highlight some issues and some very little new results we had. This is a work I've done mainly with John Papaloris and Geoffroy Le Sur and Toby Heinemann who are here in the, in the room. Uh, so let me go briefly about the setup we use, which is very standard. So we've heard a lot about the sharing box already. So let me just highlight the differences. So mo most of the work will be based on Zeus, used either the ideal or non-ideal MHD. Uh, to make things as simple as we can, I use, uh, always use an isothermal equation of state in this talk. And the size of the box uh, is elongated in the y direction with uh, a ratio of pi. So I, I looked at two different field configurations, all of them starting with a vertical flux, vertical field. Uh, one which on which I will focus the most uh, has zero net, zero net vertical field trailing the, bust, uh, the box and has this configuration when you look in the radial vertical plane. And the other configuration is purely vertical field. So I'll mostly look at transport diagnostic to figure out what's going on in the, in the flow. And they are summarized here and you all know about it. And when needed, I'll use uh, uh, explicit dissipation coefficient in the simulation. And that they, they come up with uh, associated to Reynolds number for the viscosity and magnetic Reynolds number for the resistivity. And for those of you used to coming from the turbulence community, be aware that these numbers are based on the, sounds, the speed of sound here and not on the velocity fluctuations. So if you were to, to, as is commonly done in the turbulence community, if you were to look at Reynolds number based on the velocity fluctuation, there would be in general an order of magnitude smaller than the numbers are, uh, I'm going to quote because MHD turbulence driven by the MRI is subsonic with velocity fluctuation of the order of 10% of the sound speed. And of course, the important parameter we've heard about is the magnetic panel number, the ratio of viscosity of our resistivity. So why do you care about small scale dissipation? Well, we know now that when you take Zeus and run zero net flux simulation in the sharing box, at increasing resolution, we find a decreasing value of, of the transport. It seems to converge to zero. So let me stress that this is not a property of the MRI. It shouldn't be thought that it is. It's simply a numerical artifact. It, has it may not have nothing to do with the MRI. It's due to the code. And it's just telling us that what happens at the grid scale is important and is unresolved in the simulation because we haven't put dissipation coefficient in. So to, to have a meaningful simulation, we need to have proper dissipation coefficient. So when you do that now, automatically comes the question of how small can this dissipation be in a code like Zeus, for example, for numerical dissipation to be smaller than explicit dissipation. And for that, you need to monitor numerical dissipation carefully. And I'll show you to how you can have tried to do that. And it's not a trivial thing to do, and you're never quite sure of what you're doing. So I'll show you three different methods by which you can try to get a handle on that. Uh, the first is to start with the standard, uh, the standard simulation without dissipation coefficient, say with 128 grid points per scale height, uh, and run a simulation. And then now if you look at the, the induction equation here, take the Fourier transport, uh, the Fourier transport form of this equation and dot product by the Fourier transform uh, complex conjugate of the magnetic field, you get an, an expression for the magnetic energy. And uh, in quasi-steady state, uh, the time derivative is zero. Uh, but of course, the right-hand side is not zero. It's the source time. It's what drives the turbulence. And it, it's balanced by numerical dissipation. So now you can assume that numerical dissipation as in spectral space as the form uh, eta times k squared b k squared or in other words, it's proportional to k squared bk squared with the proportionality constant that you can identify by the resistivity. And you can, so you can do that for the run, for one of the run I showed you before. So this is 
this quantity here I, would, I will call the residual and that's the solid line in this plot as a function of, sp of k. And the dashed line is, in, is, is proportional to k squared bk squared and I've chosen this parameter eta here so that at large k it matches the solid line. So you see that you have at large k you have a pretty good fit of the numerical data. It's not so good at large scale or small k and that's for at least for one reason, one reason for that is that you don't have as many large scale as, as small scales. So you have averaging issues here, uh, but that may not be the only thing. You may have other stuff going on al at large scale and you have no control of what you're doing here. So based on that, you, can, you get a, a number for the resi numerical resistivity and that translates into a magnetic Reynolds number which turned out here to be of the order of 30,000. And you expect the Reynolds number to be of the, of the same order because the flow dissipates on the grid scale and so does the magnetic field. But the problem here is that this magnetic Reynolds number depends on the flow. So you take another simulation at the same resolution, another flow, and you, you, you possibly can, can get a different magnetic Reynolds number. There is no reason why in your numerical scheme, the explicit resist resistivity or the explicit viscosity will not depend on the velocity and magnetic field themselves. So that's, that's not enough. But it gives you a first feeling. So for, so for example, if you do another MRI simulation with the same resolution, 128, you expect that you can do a, a numerical simulation with a magnetic Reynolds number now smaller than 30,000 and you can hope that then numerical dissipation will be smaller than physical dissipation. So in the following, I'll concentrate on a run with a Reynolds number of 3,000 roughly and a final number of four, which translate into a magnetic Reynolds number of about 12,000. So it's about three times smaller than what, you can, that what we measured for the numerical dissipation at this resolution, roughly. So when you run that simulation, that's what you get here is the time history of alpha and the other stresses below. So alpha is the upper curve and you get about 10 to the minus two in the simulation. So now you can do the same analysis as before, right? The induction equation. Now you have a di an explicit dissipation term on the right hand side and the all right hand side is balanced by numerical dissipation again, but you want this residual now to be much smaller than the explicit dissipation at all scales for numerical dissipation to be smaller than explicit dissipation. So you can plot the same quantity again in k space. So the residual is the solid line again. And you see that at all k, not at all k actually, but over at large k at least, it's the explicit dissipation dominates over numerical dissipation. But again, you have issues at large scale. And it's not completely clear whether this is a statistical effect or whether it, is, it has more to do, uh, it has more in your, there is more hidden in your numerical scheme. So again, you're not sure of what you're, completely sure of what you're doing. You can also uh, do a third experiment, vary the numerical resi resolution, uh, fixing this time the explicit dissipation and hopefully eventually the, re the resolution will be large enough, then uh, numerical dissipation will be dominated by explicit dissipation. So here are three simulations with resolution varying from 64 to 256 with the same parameters as before. And here are the three values of alpha. They range from eight tens to minus three to 10 to minus two. So you have a very small variation. So based on this result, you could conclude that 64 grid points per scale height is enough. To, uh, in other words, in this simulation, you could conclude that here numerical dissipation is small. Yes, at the same parameter as before, a Reynolds number of 3,000 and PM equal four. So, but uh, so uh, the problem is if you look more carefully at this guy here with 64 grid point and re reproduce the analysis I've shown you before, you now realize that at large k the residual is comparable to eta k squared b squared, the explicit dissipation. So here, so here the, the large uh, oscillation at small k are due to the fact that 
I didn't use as many snapshots to average the data uh, compared to before. But at, at uh, large k, the residual is well converged and the numerical dissipation is of the same order as the explicit dissipation. So even though you get a, a quite a good val uh, value of alpha, similar to the other resolution, if you want to do to look at, your, at the flow in more details, that might not be enough. You may want to, you may need larger resolution. So eventually, uh, what we did also to be more sure is to make a code comparison. That's what we were discussing this morning. So here we use three different methods and four different codes. Pencil code, a Nirvana and Zeus, which are clones of each other, and a spectral code. Um, we got the same value of alpha for in all of, of the four methods uh, around tensor minus two. So that, that the three, the four methods I described uh, taken all together suggest that numerical dissipation for this particular model is not dominant when you look at transport coefficient. So we discussed this morning about the results of Athena. So I figured out I should show you something about it. So I, did, uh, RAMS, I used RAMSES, which is a, a good enough code, uh, very similar to Athena. Uh, and I ran the same problem uh, with this code uh, using the sharing box model again. Uh, that's the data. The scale here, the vertical scale is a bit larger than in the other panel. It goes to four times tensor minus two. And the alpha value I get is about 40% larger uh, than all the other form code. I think this is significant. Uh, I'm running now, so the, the resolution here is 128 cells per scalite. It seems that uh, the explicit, the, the numerical magnetic Reynolds number you get in Ramses uh, is larger at a g given resolution than what you get in Zeus. Uh, because, and that's, I think I understand why. It's, it's work in progress, but uh, I think it's, it's, it is because the effective kernel number of a code like Ramses or Athena is larger than the effective kernel number of Zeus. So you get a lot, you tend to, to produce a larger activity, mostly due to numerical reason, reason uh, in these runs than you do with Zeus. And the bad news is that now, if you want to, if you want to run this case and have explicit dissipation dominate over resistive dissipation, you would need a larger resolution with Ramses than with Zeus. And uh, I will, we don't agree with Jim on that, but uh, I would think that this is the same with Athena. Sorry? I'm sorry? It's higher effective kernel number. Is that something that I have no idea what it's, what it's, what it's. So, so it means your effective dissipation coefficients aren't really dominant? In this case, yes. So, but I, I'm now running a, a model with one, 200 cells per scalite, and I've done 40 orbits, and uh, alpha seems to be smaller than this case. So it seems to be converging to the same uh, uh, alpha values as the other models. Can you give the error bars in these it's about it's about two times ten to the minus uh, three. One point one point five between one point five and two. So now uh, I discussed all this uh, thing about numerical dissipation, and that's not simple as you could tell. But once you get a good feeling for how your code dissipates, you can start a, a, a parameter survey. And that's what we've done. So let me start with uh, this uh, snapshot, which, which are uh, illustrating the flow structure that you get in, in this sharing box simulation of zero net flux sharing box simulation. And they turn out to be very similar to what has been obtained in the last 15 years without dissipation coefficient. The density here shows uh, density waves propagating radially in the box. And you, you can look at the uh, Tobias Heinemann poster uh, in, w in which he discussed that. Uh, here you have snapshot of the vertical velocity and by component, and here there are magnetic field lines viewed in 3D. What I wanted to show you here is that um, this uh, structure of the flow in the velocity and by component are very similar to what you get in, in a large PM a numerical simulation of uh, homogeneous turbulence, such as those done by Alex, and he will tell us a, a lot more about that tomorrow, but you see that you have the same current sheets uh, in this simulation that you get in the MRI simulation. And that's where we're in a, with a PM that is also larger than one as it is in this simulation. So you can 
also a very so so now you can explore the parameter the, the parameter space uh, first fixing for example the Reynolds number the magnetic Reynolds number uh, in other words the resistivity and increasing the viscosity so that the time history of alpha you get 10 to the minus 2 for that case if you double the resistivity the viscosity you increase the the the, the transport and if you now decrease the Prenal number, you lose turbulence here after 90 orbits. Turbulence is not sustained, and so it is for PM equals 1. So that's the first case. Alpha increases with the Prenal number. Uh, you can also fix the Prenal number and decrease the dissipation coefficient in the same ratio each time to see whether alpha converges when you increase the Reynolds number. And the aim would be to go to extremely large Reynolds number to see uh, whether alpha converges or not toward a, a given value. So again, this is the same run as before. And if you double the Reynolds number using 256 grid point per scale height, you get an, uh, an alpha value which is a bit smaller, about 7.5, 10 to the minus 3. So I run, I doubled the Reynolds number again and ran a 512 by 800 by 512 simulation using the good resources we have and the CEA. Uh, I have to say that this is a huge simulation and I can't do anything more than that. It, it, I burned about 500,000 CPU hours in the last uh, three or, or four months. It's about 60 years of CPU time. You have to run that stuff on 1,000 CPUs for three weeks. It's a massive number of time step. It generates a large amount of data. And at the end of the day, that's what you get. <laughs> 70 orbits, something which doesn't look very much converge. Alpha of the order of 2 times 10 to the minus 2. And that's it. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't make me laugh like that. Because I, burn, I burn a lot of time on that. But so the only conclusion I would make of that is that I, I don't see any systematic trend it's in alpha as yeah but I still I looked at the I tried to look at the power spectrum spectra of this uh, in this simulation so let's first concentrate on the on the first one which is the for the standard case the comparison case with Reynolds number of 3000 uh, the the solid line is the kinetic energy the, the dashed line is the magnetic energy uh, and the dotted line uh, is a k to the minus 5 third uh, line, which is the Kolmogorov spectrum. Uh, there seems to be a good fit to the data over about half a decade only. Uh, the magnetic spectrum looks much flatter down to la smaller scale, and then falls off eventually. You see that the, the curl of the resistive scale seems to be small, is smaller than the viscous scale. That's because PM is larger than 1. You get about the same thing with a Reynolds number of 6,000 6, with things pushed to, towards smaller scale. However, when you do that with the, tr the 512 cube simulation, it's not so obvious that you can fit a Kolmogorov spectrum to the kinetic energy. The, things, the, the spectrum seems to be flatter at larger scale. At larger scale. I, I don't know whether it's a, a true effect of whether it's due to things not being fully converged yet. So more on, I need to do more analysis. So a summary, so here you have, this was shown before by Geoffroy in the, this is the summary of what we, we are, where we are now in this uh, zero net flux case. In the REPM plane, you have the same plot in the REM plane. And that's, that's what we get. We, we see an, an increase of alpha with PM, and it's not clear what happens when you go to large RE so far. And at each Reynolds number, you have a critical Reynolds number below which turbulence dies away, and it seems to that this critical Prenal number decreases with Reynolds number. Uh, I wanted to add something about the transition where you, uh, in which you lose turbulence. So that's a closer loop between uh, 40 and 120 orbit of the PM equal 4 case with a Reynolds number of 3,000. 3, if you go to PM equals 3, you still have a, a large, ac pretty large activity with alpha of the order of 5 times 10 to the minus 3 when average of the last 50 orbit. And turbulence dies at PMs of the order of 2.5. And we realized la last year with Tobias, I think, that it seems like this transition is very sharp. 
And I run additional simulation varying the kernel number by increment of 0.1 between 2.5 and, and, and 4, actually. And here is what you get. So you, it seems like you have either a pretty large activity with alpha of the order of 4 to 5 tensor minus 3 or 0. And uh, the transition seems to happen uh, really abruptly. So you, for example, it's difficult. It's impossible. I couldn't get alpha of the order of tensor minus 3 in the simulations. So it's probably because uh, as alpha gets smaller and smaller, the st typical structure that you have in this flow gets smaller and smaller again. And eventually, they, they become so small that they are affected by, uh, tur by explicit dissipation this time. And it just cuts off, the cuts off the turbulence. You don't have it anymore. So now, what's about vertical net flux? So it's the same. You need explicit dissipation put in when you do vertical net flux calculation. And again, alpha is a strongly dependent function of the Prenel number. So that's the result that Geoffroy and Pierre-Yves uh, uh, found last, last year as well. Here are a set of simulation that run with the pseudo-spectral code. Uh, alpha varies quite uh, dramatically when PM is varied between 0.1 and 8. Here the difference is that you always have the net flux to support the turbulence, so turbulence never goes away. So you, even for PM as low as 0.1, they get a large amount of, of uh, turbulence. You see that at a given Prenel number, the scatter is pretty small compared to the scatter you have when you vary the Prenel number. So probably when you run, if you were to run that simulation with Zeus, you would find a good convergence with resolution uh, in this case because uh, as you vary, when you vary the resolution, the resolution with Zeus, you probably work at a fairly constant PM value. Uh, so if you were to run that with Zeus without dissipation coefficient, you could conclude that alpha is converged. But in fact, it doesn't mean that it doesn't depend on the PM value. Now that's to link with what you were saying this morning. And it's the same is likely to be true with uh, net flux in the toroidal direction. Demonstrating with Zeus without explicit dissipation that you have convergence when you increase dissipation when you increase resolution, doesn't mean that you don't need explicit dissipation put in. Because you have the d this effect of the Prenel number, and you have no control on that unless you p explicitly put dissipation coefficient in. It's very large value, that's what you want. So which one? 200 then? The yellow box and the purple circle. Yes. Right, are part of the part. They have different values of alpha. Yes, but so but I suppose the error bars here are very large. Yeah. The so bars of, of the so, so the error bars are probably consistent with them being the same. If, if there is a sense to this, is that they all seem to be moving toward the same value as the Reynolds number goes up. Um, I'm not sure. I would say that if you look at, la at small PM, uh, the same alpha seems to be slightly increasing. Uh, oh, you think you, you're saying that yeah, they become independent it of? Looks, it looks as if I, if I did this at a Reynolds number in a million. You would, oh, oh, maybe. Yeah. So that that's last year in Grenoble we speculated that alpha as a function of PM would be something like that. Uh, it would saturate at large, very large, and very low PM. Uh, so far, so this may be the case. Uh, we are only, with the only simulation that have been run, only focus of the region close to one, and, all, and uh, because for numerical reason. We don't know whether such a turnoff exists. It still remains to be demonstrated. We don't know how it depends on the Reynolds number, that, which is your point. Maybe these curves become flat at a Reynolds number of infinity. We don't know really how this curve depends on beta. We can al also look at the flow structure in these models. So here are snapshots uh, extracted from this simulation at PM very much larger than one and at PM very much smaller than one. So again, in the uh, vertical magnetic field snapshot, you tend to see these currents uh, appearing uh, which are similar to, to, which tend to be similar to what I showed you before. The structure of the flow is 
much different in the small PM case, uh, seems to be very much dominated by the channel flow. And again, you can compare that, you can compare that with Alex results, and, and you, you find the same sort of current sheet uh, that Alex got in his simulation. Uh, otherwise, at least to me, the situation doesn't seem so simple uh, when you compare the low PM case uh, where the channel mode seems to have a strong impact on, on the flow. The other, the other thing that you can do with this NetFlux simulation is look at the uh, look at the linear modes and try to compare, try to figure out whether the saturated state of alpha has anything to do with the growth rate of these linear modes. So that's this is what is done here, where for the same parameter of the simulation, so here is an insert showing the alpha value as a PM, that's the plot I, you had before. So here are the growth rates as a function of PM for all the same cases. And you see that there is no correspondence between the two. Although the growth rates tend to increase with PM, if you take this guy, for example, you have a much larger growth rate than this one, but the alpha value is much smaller than this guy. So there is... There is, there, is no, there is no reason, but you, you could, that, that would be the most, uh, yeah, that's the simplest thing you could, you could think about. And when you look at the flow, you see also that it's much, very much influenced by the channel mode. So maybe that, that had an effect, but it turned out not to be the case. Uh, so I'll, I'll finish here. So, so the bottom line here is that both viscosity and resistivity are important in uh, looking at showing box simulation of the MRI, both when you have zero net flux and when you have non-zero net flux trading the box. Although we didn't do it, it's likely that it's the case regardless of whether you have a vertical or a toroidal net flux trading the box. So alpha is a, seems to be an increasing function of PM. That's the only result, the, the only solid result we have so far. Uh, the behavior at large, Reynolds number is, is unclear. And there are lots of open questions. Uh, what happens when you have vertical stratification? Uh, what is the effect of compressibility? Uh, what happens in global simulation? Uh, what is the effect of large scales? And that's uh, linked to the talk this morning uh, by Charles. Uh, uh, we need large box, uh, large, large sharing box simulation. And should we do this sort of big simulation I've done? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, what, what, is the, what is the numerical scheme we should use? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> and probably, as pointed out, uh, we should push toward larger D simulation because we'll never be able to do global simulation resolving the small scale. So if we ever want to do global simulation, uh, taking this sort of effect into account with realistic values or realistic scales uh, result, we need larger dissimulations. Otherwise, we'll never be able to do it. Um, I'll stop here. Thank you. It's just to be cautious, I would say. I don't have any reason to believe if that they would change. Uh, any reason to believe they would change, but. Uh, Sorry, what? You said that profile simulations which are stratified will crash. No, they don't. No, no, but they, they crash with a netflux. If, if, you are, if you have a zero netflux, they don't crash. Yeah, sure. so, so.
Well, for example, the talk that Geoffroy gave this morning is one example of what of the sort of analysis we can do to go more than just looking at alpha in these things. Uh, we can look at uh, one of the things that I, uh, I have been trying to is look uh, more at this uh, transfer function in k space and try to figure out whether you can um, uh, isolate or uh, a region in k-space where the MRI modes are forcing the flow uh, from a region uh, where you have dissipation and try but so far I haven't been successful in doing that. No, I, have, I haven't looked in detail at that. I think, I think the, the I, Alex might be better off answering that question, but I think the magnetic, uh, the, spectru the power spectrum for the magnetic energy look a bit similar. It's flat, which is, uh, and, then, and then fall off. And I think that's what you get, Alex, in your simulation, that, that the magnetic energy spectrum seems to tend to be flat. Yeah, it's just a speak. <laughs> it's no, no, that's for the case of uh, non-zero net flux. Because for zero, for zero net flux, alpha min goes to zero. Uh, no, we don't know. We don't know what alpha min is. Sorry, I didn't understand. So the no, but you'll, you'll always have the linear instability to force the flow. You will in the in the net flux case, you will always have the the linear instability at very large Reynolds numbers. So in real disk. You'd always have the linear instability present, and w it is likely that it's going to make this curve turn over and saturate at a non-zero value. Yeah. 